All right, Roman MMA, welcome back to the channel. Now, UFC 303, Alex Peta versus Yuri Prosca 2 takes place tomorrow evening, and I wanted to give an official picks and predictions video, so we are going to be doing that right now. We will start with the first fight of the night, work our way up as usual. So let us get started with the first fight right away, which is Ricky Simone versus Vinicius Oliveira. Okay, I'm going to be picking Vinicius Oliveira to get this one done as an underdog. This guy has pretty good experience outside the UFC. He's fought a lot of guys with really good records, unlike some of these new up-and-comers we see come from the Contender Series and stuff like that. He won his debut in the UFC with a flying knee, which is awesome, okay? He wins the vast majority of his fights by knockout. He's only ever lost by knockout as well, so he's an exciting fighter no matter what, basically, win or lose. Ricky Simone doesn't usually knock dudes out, okay? He has a handful throughout his career, but he usually grinds out decisions. A lot of them have been very, uh, very close recently, the ones that he's won at the very least. Um, and I think that Oliveira should be able to out-damage him and win rounds, even if he can't find the knockout, okay? He's never been submitted, and Ricky Simone likes to take guys down and kind of grind them out, not do a whole lot of damage. To boot, I don't think he's going to be able to submit Vinicius Oliveira, and he's got one TKO in the last six years or so, and considering that that seems to be the only way you get Vinicius Oliveira out of there, I don't think Ricky Simone gets it done. He's kind of appeared to be on a bit of a decline recently anyways. Now, moving up the card to... Ria or Rai Tsusura or something, okay, versus Carlos Hernandez. This guy looks like uh, he's in a K-pop band, but either way, I will be picking him to get the job done, okay? Surya, I don't know how to say his name properly, but either way, dude. Mainly because Carlos Hernandez is very, very inconsistent, especially since getting into the UFC. He's gone 2-2 two and two since being here. Both of those losses were by finish, and his wins are, have been a technical decision and a split decision against pretty low-level competition, guys that have not had a whole lot of success in the UFC. Also, he's only ever finished guys by submission and uh, Syria, or Syria has never been subbed, okay? And has a few himself, so I believe he's competent enough on the ground to not get submitted. And I do believe he's gonna have the advantage in the striking department, so that's why I will be going with him. Moving up the card to Andre Arlovsky versus Martin Budai. I will be picking Andre Arlovsky, okay? Pretty big underdog to boot. like. Martin Badai is close to a minus 300, which I cannot for the life of me understand, especially after he just got wiped by Gazeev, who went and gassed himself out in his first ever main event, his first ever big opportunity, and looked pretty horrible doing so, okay? Badai has not gotten a knockout in like three years, okay? And Arlovsky's only ever been subbed three times in his career in almost 60 fights, right? And Martin Badai, he does get guys in submission sometimes, but I don't think he's going to be able to do it to Arlovsky. I think Arlovsky's going to stick and move at range and kind of wear Budai out and just kind of get this one done via experience and crafty veteranness that we do see from Andre Arlovsky from time to time. Uh, he also seems to have like kind of revived his chin a bit. I know he got knocked out. I think it was maybe two fights ago, but regardless, I think he should be able to keep safe and just poke and prod at Martin Budai, winning himself a decision. Moving up the card to Michelle Watterson Gomez versus Jillian Robertson, okay? I'm picking Robertson. I have no idea why Michelle Watterson is even still around, but I'll tell you what, dude, okay? I'll tell you this much. I have never been so excited to watch somebody swing at air seven feet away from their opponent before because that's essentially all we get from Michelle Watterson while keying to boot, okay? Also, while like mean mugging is if she fights like Justin Gaethje. It's unhinged to me. She does exactly what Macy Barber used to do. Only Macy Barber has made improvements, okay, since she used to do that. Michelle Watterson will literally throw a kick from across the octagon. Not a feint, not a fake. She'll throw the strike, okay? It's unbelievable. Also, she's been submitted in a third of her 12 losses, okay? She's 18 and 12. She's got subbed four times. Jillian Robertson, nine submissions on her record. Aside from one loss, in her last like five or six, she's looked pretty damn good as of late. So I do think Jillian Robertson should be able to get this one done by decision. Moving up the card, okay? Peyton Talbot versus Giannis Gamori. For me, this is a no-brainer. I'm going Peyton Talbot, all right? He's very good, very fun to watch. Gamori got TKO'd with a body kick last time out, so he's not necessarily all that durable at striking range. Peyton Talbot has very good striking at range. He's got good grappling as well. He's also very zesty. Okay, which I guess is a good base for MMA considering some of the guys that we see win on a regular basis. But I tell you what, I don't know that I'd feel comfortable betting this shit unless you are going to sprinkle a little bit of money on Giannis Gamori just for the fuck of it. Because minus 1700 is insane. 
though I do kind of understand it considering he whooped Cameron Simon last time out, which was a rel uh, relatively big jump competition for him compared to who he had been fighting uh, right before that. So I'm going Peyton Talbot. Probably gets it done by finish. I could see him submitting this dude like early in the second round or late in the first round or something along those lines. Moving up the card to Charles Jordan versus Gian Silva. I'm going to trust in Charles Jordan one final time, okay? He's not been very consistent, and oftentimes when I do pick him, he doesn't get the job done, okay? Now I'm kind of coping with this pick because Charles Jordan is like the only based Canadian that exists in the UFC. If you go watch his Instagram stories, I would imagine you will at the very least chuckle, okay? But that being said, John Silva only has one fight in the UFC. And if you go back and look at his record before he got here, just two fights ago, the guy was fighting a dude that was 9-9, nine and nine, right? You go a little bit further down on his record, we see 11-5, and five, okay? I feel like his resume is a little bit padded. His last, two, uh, his last two fights were by far the best records of his opponents to date. Um, he usually wins by knockout. Charles Jordan has never been knocked out, okay? And he's fought some pretty decently sized dudes, some pretty good competition. Those are really the only guys that he loses to are decent guys. Sean Woodson good and tricky to deal with, right? Very long, rangy, good boxer. Nathaniel Wood, pretty good as well. So I'm going to trust Charles Jordan, hopefully, to win himself a decision here using kind of like Andre Arlovsky, just veteranness, craftiness, considering he's been in there with a lot of very good competitors and John Silva is new to the UFC. So Charles Jordan by decision. Moving up the card to Cub Swanson versus Andre Feely. I love this fight. I wish it was on the main card instead of Myro Bueno Silva versus Macy Chasson because I feel like at this point in these guys, these two guys' careers, this is like the perfect matchup. Okay, I will be picking Andre Feely. Um, man, it's a bit of a toss-up. They've both been pretty inconsistent, both you know, win one, lose one, and kind kind of deal. But Cub, in the last eight years, has gone four and six. Uh, he got finished in four of those six losses. Okay, he's quite a bit older as well. He's pushing. I, th he, I think he is forty actually. Andre Feely, I think, is 34, so there's a pretty significant age gap there. Guys above the age of 35 don't tend to do that well. At the lower weight classes, uh, he's probably taken less damage overall throughout his career as well compared to Cub Swanson, who's been finished in, as I said, four of his last six losses and had a bunch of wars to boot before that. Uh, so while Andre Feely's kind of inconsistent, he's been losing to pretty decent guys like Danny Gay and stuff like that, so I feel like he should be able to get this one done. Also, he had a pretty good finish just two fights ago, which was... I don't know, uh, six, seven months ago, something like that. So I'm going with Andre Fila to get the job done over Cub Swanson. Moving up the card, dude, to Joe Pfeiffer versus Mark andre Barrio. Okay. I feel like this pick is maybe more from a betting standpoint. I am going to pick Mark andre Barrio as a pretty sizable underdog. Okay. I feel like Joe Pfeiffer should be able to get this one done. But as I said, I'm still going to pick Mark andre Barrio as an underdog. He has fought way better competition throughout his career. He's only ever been knocked out once, uh, once, pardon me, which when you watch Jack, or, or, uh, Jack Hermanson versus Joe Pfeiffer, that seems to be the only way that Joe Pfeiffer is going to be able to beat opponents is if they fold like relatively early in the fight because after that first round, you know, Jack Hermanson kind of just sunned him, like schooled him, showed him what's what, and Joe Pfeiffer didn't really have a whole lot after his power kind of ran out or after he realized that Jack Hermanson has a hell of a chin. And he's not just going to go away. Mark andre Barrio is not necessarily one of those guys that just goes away, right? His only knockout is to, his only knockout loss is to Chidi Nujinkwani or whatever the fuck who, if I'm not mistaken, fights at light heavyweight anyways. Now he's a big dude, right? Uh, Mark andre Barrio last time out just stood in the pocket with Chris Curtis. Both landed a ton of shots like he eats them all. He sets a crazy, crazy pace that a lot of guys cannot keep up with. And I feel like he's going to make it ugly, dirty, dogfight type shit, pushing him up against the cage clinching and whatever just to wear out Joe Pfeiffer's arms and I don't know that Joe Pfeiffer is going to be able to land the kind of stuff that he likes to land in a fight like that because he kind of likes to you know land big straight shots and whatever so while I do think Joe Pfeiffer could get it done and I'm not overly confident in this pick just considering how big of an underdog Mark andre Barrio is considering how Joe Pfeiffer looked against his first you know real good competition um, in the UFC I feel like it could be a good underdog pick here. Moving up the card to Ian Gary. I'm not going to say both names. Versus Michael Benham Page. Um, I'm picking Ian Gary by decision. Okay. I think that this fight is going to look 
identical or very similar at the very least to Stephen Wonderboy Thompson and Darren Till. Okay, we've got Michael Venom Page will be the Stephen Wonderboy Thompson in this case. Darren Till will be Ian Gary in this situation. I think that they will both be relatively hesitant, respectful of each other's abilities. I think neither of them is going to want to get caught with some big shit. I think we'll see leg kicks from Ian Gary. I think we'll see a lot of hopping around from MVP, maybe the occasional sidekick to the knee, things like that. I also think that MVP might have a few moments where he lands shots with the hands, where he kind of darts in, lands a few good shots or whatever, but I don't think it's going to be consistent enough. I don't think his volume is going to be enough. And I think that Ian Gary's just going to chip away at his legs and things like that. Um, you know, Ian Gary's got a much more sophisticated striking arsenal compared to Kevin Holland. He'll actually throw leg kicks. He's not just waiting to hit you with one single shot. Do you know what I mean? And every time Michael Venom Page has fought guys that are good, he doesn't finish them. So while we could have a performance like he had against Kevin Holland, you know, uh, I just, I don't know, man. I feel like Ian Gary with the leg kicks will be similar to Diego Lima. And I'm not saying that he's going to starch him or put him away or anything like that, but it's just that Diego Lima did give Michael Venom Page problems because of the leg kicks, the more fundamental base striking, the like more Muay, Muay Thai-ish type style. And I think that's what we're going to see for me and Gary, who is good at landing leg kicks. And honestly, dude, I hope they prove me wrong because I would rather this not stink up the main card with three rounds of very minimal activity, okay? Somebody, I hope one of them knocks each other out, but I just don't think it's going to happen. I don't like either of these guys. MVP advocates for punishments and fines for trash talk. And Ian Gary's Ian Gary. So, you know, hopefully, uh, hopefully we get one of them at least knocked out. So... That's it. Decision, Ian Gary. Moving up the card, Myro Bueno Silva versus Macy Chasson. Uh, Macy Chasson, pardon me. Again, I have no idea why this is on the main card. This is literally a buzzkill. This is like, you just ruined the main card with this fight, okay? But either way, with that being said, who fucking cares? I guess I'm going to go Myro Bueno Silva because she did not get subbed by Raquel Pennington. She just lost a decision, which is kind of pathetic when you remember that Raquel Pennington is the bantamweight champion of the fucking world, okay? So, uh, you know, uh, that's all I'm going to say about this fight. Who cares? It should have been on the prelims. Hopefully, it's hopefully it ends quickly. That's all I'm going to say. All right, moving up the card to Anthony Smith versus Roman Delize. Now, I need to preface, okay? I am an expert in all things Anthony Smith. In his last three fights, I've picked them all correctly, okay? I said he would sub Petrino. I said he would beat Ryan Spam, and I picked Khalil Roundtree to beat him, okay? So, just keep that in mind. While he's delusional, and he likes his own voice quite a bit, he likes to talk a lot, probably because of all the podcasting he does with Michael Bisping, um, I do think that he gets this one done, okay? Roma Delize, not very good in the areas where Smith struggles, like striking distance, right? His best win is Jack Hermanson, that was two years ago. Um, aside from that, He's lost to every good or decent opponent he's ever fought because his two most recent losses are to Marvin Vittori and Nasruddin Imabov, okay? Losing a decision to Marvin Vittori, not a great look, especially at this stage in his career, okay? Nasruddin Imabov did pretty goddamn well against Roma Delize too. The only reason that was even a close decision whatsoever is because Imabov had a point deducted, you know what I mean? So... Aside from those two guys, you look down Roman Delize's record, it's like Kyle Dawkins, like dudes like this. Do you know what I mean? Guys that aren't even in the UFC anymore. So, I don't know, man. Also, keep in mind, Roman Delize moving up a weight class, okay? He was already slow at middleweight. I have a feeling that's not going to help. 20 extra pounds on his body, so he's not going to be overly fast or explosive. A lot of what Roman Delize uh, relies on is like scrambles and things like that. Anthony Smith, despite all the crazy shit he says, is a very competent grappler. I don't think he's going to be given his back and shit like that, which is kind of what Roman Delize needs. So I think that Anthony Smith is going to do well on the feet, actually. And I think that if it does get into a grappling exchange, I think that Smith, who's been fighting with larger guys for quite some period of time, okay, and is a good grappler, sub guys like Ryan Spann, who's way bigger and more powerful than Roman Delize. I understand Roman Delize is probably a better technical grappler than a guy like Ryan Spann grappler pardon me or a Vitor Petrino even but I don't know man I think Anthony Smith subs him or something along those lines and as I said dude keep in mind I am an expert in all things Anthony Smith I do not pick his fights wrong despite making fun of him on a regular basis okay so yeah that being said Anthony Smith by submission or I could see him kind of vetting it out same sort of deal as Arlovsky 
winning a decision based on his, you know, veteran craftiness or whatever the fuck you want to call it, all right? Moving up the card to Brian Ortega versus Diego Lopez. Very excited for this fight. Um, this fight was announced yesterday, if I'm not mistaken. It's at lightweight. Uh, or it was maybe announced right before the official weigh-ins. I'm not sure why that is. I don't know if it's one of them was un uh, unable to make the weight or if it was just to accommodate for the short notice nature of the fight. But either way, dude, I will be picking Diego Lopez, okay? He is bigger. He is faster. He's more explosive. He's more active. In my opinion, he's better on the feet. Also, I think he's adept enough on the ground or in the grappling department to not just get subbed. Listen, I a lot of people are acting as though Diego Lopez is like a hype train, right? People forget, man. This guy came in, in his debut, short notice, against a guy that is now ranked inside the top five of the featherweight division, and in my opinion, won that fight. Do you know what I mean? Mavzar Ebluev, while being a little boring, even though his fight with Arnold Allen was very fun, is not, is he's no fucking joke, dude. When you have a very close decision against a guy like that in your debut on short notice in which, in my opinion and the opinion of many, you did more damage and should have potentially won that fight based on submission attempts and things like that, you're not a fucking hype train, dude. You're just not. Do you know what I mean? Diego Lopez is legitimately skilled. Also, Brian Ortega has horrible striking defense, okay? Horrible striking defense. Also... His striking accuracy is even worse percentage-wise than his defense, okay? So while we've seen him look good in certain moments of certain fights, mainly off the top of my head, like the Korean zombie fight, he looked like a world beater on the feet, right? But that's the Korean zombie, dude. That is his best performance in the striking department out of any, okay? Also, I think we might be starting to see the decline of Brian Ortega's chin, okay? We saw him get dropped by Yair Rodriguez with a punch. Now... Yair Rodriguez, for the most part, his the, the strikes that he hurts dudes with are kicks oftentimes. Like, his kicking game is a lot better than his hands, okay? And a lot more powerful than his hands as well, okay? Brian Ortega, before that fight, if I'm not mistaken, you have to go back to his fight with Clay Guida to see him dropped. I could, be, I could be wrong about that. I could be forgetting about one off the top of my head, but I'm pretty sure it was a long time ago before uh, Brian Ortega got dropped, okay? Also, that happened very quickly in the fight, okay? Diego Lopez has that style. He is going to go out there immediately. He is not going to give you a chance to settle in, which Brian Ortega does kind of like to do. He is going to fucking bum rush you. And I feel like that benefits him against a guy like a Brian Ortega. Okay, and as I said, Diego Lopez, very big, very strong. He does like to tie up in the clinch a little bit, which could be a little bit concerning. Brian Ortega is very good at lacing shit up quickly, especially in areas like the clinch, as we saw against Cub Swanson and, and whatever. I feel like he's going to be good enough at grappling, okay, uh, defensively speaking, to not just get subbed immediately. I think that he's bigger, stronger, so he will be able to control Brian in the clinch if he so chooses. I think on the feet, he's got an advantage as well. And um, I think that if he gets Brian Ortega hurt in the same way that Yair Rodriguez did at the beginning of their fight, I don't think he fumbles it, and I think he probably gets the job done, okay? You can only take so many shots for so long. Diego Lopez hasn't taken as many uh, as much damage, at the very least, not that we've seen, right? Brian Ortega's been involved in some brutal fucking wars in which he is usually on the losing end of, okay? So, all that being said, I'm going Diego Lopez. Um, Brian Ortega might be able to vet this one out, who knows, but I think Diego Lopez is legit. Despite his age, he's got more experience than Brian Ortega um, in MMA. He's been more active as well, right? Brian Ortega did look a little bit rusty in the beginning of that year, uh, yeah, year Rodriguez fight. So yeah, I'm going Lopez, dude. I don't think he's a hype train. I don't think it's fair to call him that. I think he's very skilled fucking everywhere. He's very powerful and he goes for the finish every single time. So no matter what, I think we will get a very entertaining fight. Okay. Now let us move up to the main event. Alex Peta versus Yuri Prohaska too. Um, I'm going Alex Pajeda again, okay, because I don't think that there are many adjustments Yuri Prohaska could have made in between those two fights that would change the outcome significantly, okay? In his fight versus Alexander Rakic, we saw all the same problems that he had against Alex Pajeda. He's very susceptible to leg kicks to the point where he was having to switch stances even when he didn't necessarily want to. Now, Yuri Prohaska switches stances a lot anyways, but you can tell when it's forced, okay? 
He's very heavy on that lead leg, so he will not be checking kicks. He can't do it. He just can't do it. Alexander Rakic has way more of a tell, way more of a wind-up to his leg kick than Alex Pajeda does, and Yuri Proska was not able to check a single one of them. He just got both of his legs completely battered in that fight. Now, I don't know that it's going to end with the same strike, okay? Alex Pajeda, every time I try to pick a different method, he always ends up doing the left hook, but I feel like it's boring if I just say, left hook KO. Do you know what I mean? Now, I think Yuri Proska is going to be very aware of the left hook. I think he's going to be doing everything he can to stay away from that. He's probably going to be circling to the opposite side. And I, if you go back and watch that Rakic fight, which is a good representation of Yuri Proska, every single fight he's been in, aside from the Alex Pajeda one, basically, and Glover, right? Volkan, Ozdemir, uh, Dominic Reyes, these kind of guys, he gets hurt badly. Because he is so fucking hittable, okay? And then he turns around and comes back. In the Rakic fight, I was watching it in half speed. And in the first minute and a half, Yuri Prohaska ducks down, dips his head in front of him to the point where his nose are like over top of his knees. Five times in a minute and a half. It is a habit, okay? So if he is very concerned about the left hook, I have a feeling he's going to be doing that. Even more so because he's going to be trying to stay away from that height. But I think he's going to eat a fucking knee, okay? Because Alex Pajeda, something that he is very good at is picking up on habits and finding a split second in which he can capitalize on it. And I think that that's what he's going to do. Yuri Prosk, as I said, it's almost every single time he enters for a strike too, he dips and then comes back up, lunges back up. Oftentimes too, they were like his head was below his opponent's chest. I mean, you don't even need to get the knee up that high. So I think that Alex Pajeda is going to take note of that. I think he's going to know that Yuri Prohaska is looking out for the left hook. So maybe he'll get him thinking about it, getting him dipping, getting him to circle to the opposite side so he can land one of those jump switch knees, right? And we saw this against Andre Michalaitis. Very slight movement from Michalaitis downwards. Alex Pay to put him out with a knee. We saw this multiple times in his kickboxing career. We also saw that Alex Pajeda can actually defend on the ground against Yuri Prohaska. Yuri Prohaska was able to take him down. Not able to do fucking anything with it, okay? Couldn't do anything with it. And uh, I don't know that that's going to change. I also think that it doesn't really behoove Yuri Proska to attempt a fight like that, considering that's not usually how he fights. And that could end up in uh, tiring him out a little bit quicker than normal. So I think that we have very similar result. I think it's a knockout or a TKO for Alex Peda. I think that we get a much better stoppage this time, much more clear. I bet Yuri Proska goes like out for real or at the very least there's not much to contest when it comes to the stoppage um also dude honestly like it's kind of a meme at this point but when you're bringing up the fact that your opponent is using fucking magic okay you can joke in the comments all you want talk about how he's right he's on to something or whatever you can believe in it even in my opinion if you believe in that sort of thing i'm not i'm not even going to call you fucking crazy but the way it manifests is just mental warfare. I don't, Alex Pay does not use a magic, okay? You can say he's doing these rituals and things like that, but if you were seriously focused on what the uh, on what this guy's like pre-fight uh, routine is, there's you're concerned. Do you know what I mean? There's that's the only way you can look at it, logically speaking, uh, in my opinion, is that Yuri Proska is worried about Alex Pajeda. He is, you know. So I just, I don't know, man, you can't think that dude, or at the very least you shouldn't vocalize it because you, your opponent now knows, oh dude, he's real fucking worried about me. Okay. He is real worried about me. Also, as many people pointed out in my comment section, a little bit hypocritical because Yuri goes and locks himself in rooms for three fucking days in the pitch black and does similar kind of rituals and shit. So listen, dude, I think Alex Peda is going to just butcher his legs from the get go immediately. Both legs, Yuri Proska is going to switch stances. When Yuri Proska goes into southpaw, this is when I think the knee will happen. I think he will go into southpaw. I think he will circle to Alex Peda's right side, which will be Yuri Proska's power side in that stance. And I think he'll dip down one too many times. And I think Alex Peda is going to fucking time a knee and just blast him. All right. So anyways, dude, that is it. Like and subscribe. I would greatly appreciate it. I'll see you at the next video. Bye-bye.